going to do things from top down with uh, recursion plus memoization. How you're going to keep the memo and how you're going to how you're going to actually maintain a table of what you've done before and check to see each time you call the function, check that table to see if you've already done it. And we don't really want to deal with any of those implementation details. So we want to understand what it is about the fundamental structure of the problem that makes you get to put on the microphone. Can you guys hear me now? Could you hear me before? Okay, all right. Okay, all right. It's that, it's that thundering baritone. That, uh, okay. So um, we want to know what it is about the fundamental structure of a problem that makes dynamic programming work. And again, in the, in the literature, you'll see all sorts of fancy terms like optimal substructure, but um, what's really going on is, uh, is that going back to this typesetting example, right? So uh, let's say I have a five-word paragraph that I'm trying to typeset, and uh, remember that f of j is the problem of finding the lowest cost possible for typesetting <coughs> the j through nth word. So the entire paragraph corresponds to calculating f of 1. And um, in the course of calculating f of 1, I'll ask, well, what if I put a line break here? Then the cost would be the cost of whatever the cost is of putting this first word on its very own line, plus the cost of doing all the rest. <coughs> And the cost of doing all the rest recursively is f of 2. Or I could put the first line break here, in which case it would be the cost of putting these two words on their own on the first line, plus the cost of typesetting the rest, 3 through n, and so on. And what's f of 2? Well, in the same way, again, I could put the next line break here, and then I would have the cost of this one word line plus the rest, and so on. And if you, if you write this out as a tree, then, well, if, if you write this out as a tree, then indeed it has an exponential number of leaves. But that's the equivalent of a recursive algorithm which doesn't remember uh, that it's already solved one of these subproblems. And so it solves the same one many, many times, right? A standard exercise in uh, an algorithms class when you're first learning dynamic programming <coughs> is consider the following recursive algorithm for the nth Fibonacci number, right? I'm pretty sure you all saw this exercise. You know, if n is 0 or n is 1, return 1, and otherwise uh, return recursively f of n minus 1 plus f of n minus 2. How long does this take to run? It takes exponential if you don't remember that you already calculated these previous values, right? In fact, a cute fact is that the number of times the function calls itself is pretty much the Fibonacci number, uh -huh. right? So, and since those grow exponentially, so will the time. But if you remember, oh, I, I already calculated f of 3. I don't need to calculate it again. Then it takes essentially linear time, okay? Um, and if you coded it up from the bottom up instead of from the top down, <coughs> you would have a little loop, right, that says, well, if you already know f, of, if you know everything up to f of n minus 1, then here's how to get f of n. And then you just cruise up through the list of all inputs in linear time. But we can also think of it in this top-down way, recursion, but with memory and not stupidly redoing things. So in that sense, Instead of, an instead of an exponentially branching tree, we have something that looks like this. And this figure, a figure like this, appears in a lot of textbooks where, um, yes, each one of these <coughs> depends on the ones below it. But we, e we only need to calculate each thing once. <coughs> okay. And now we see that the total number of nodes <coughs> here, the total number of subproblems that we need to find, in this case, is only order n. And there are fancier problems, like in the book I talk about um, the genome alignment problem, which I, I know is also used as, a, as an example last semester in 561, where the number of subproblems is order n squared, but that's fine. 
So again, dynamic programming gives a polynomial time algorithm. But notice that we needed to we needed to think about the problem in a certain way, right? If we just dealt with it in this brute force way, and I know I've said this several times, but I'll say it once more, if you just look at all the sets of places you could put line breaks, there's an exponential number of possibilities. So if you were totally naive, you might think that this would take you exponential time to solve. To put it yet another way, again, if you're trying to typeset this list of words, you can't just use divide and conquer because you can't typeset the first half of the paragraph separately from the second half of the paragraph. But once you make a choice about where a line break goes, once you choose to put a line break here, well now, conditioned on that choice, now these parts of the problem do become separate. And they do become independent. So it becomes a sort of fancier version of divide and conquer <coughs> where you have some choices to make. You're not sure which choice will be optimal. For each choice, you can apply divide and conquer to the pieces. And then you optimize over all the choices. Okay. So that's somehow the nature of problems where dynamic programming works, that on one level, it's because the number of subproblems only grows polynomially instead of exponentially with the size of the problem. But why is that? Well, that's usually because although the different parts of the problem influence each other, once you start making choices, those choices break the influence in a, at a certain place. So one of the homework problems is about solving, using dynamic programming to solve certain problems on trees. So, um, and I'll give you the same hint, which is in the book. So there's a classic problem called maximum weight independent set. So you may have heard of independent set. This is the weighted version. So what happens is I have a graph. And on this graph, each vertex has a weight or a value. Um, an, I an independent set is one where no two neighboring vertices are both in the set. Okay. So my goal now is to find the independent set containing the largest, with the largest total weight. Which in this case, well, it's a little bit of a trade-off here. I would rather have this four than this two. But if I take the two, I mean, I can't take the two and the four because they're neighbors. But if I take the two, I lose the four, but then I can have this six. <coughs> that six looks pretty valuable. And then I can have that five and that three so this is probably the solution, I'm pretty confident. Um, now, for general graphs, it turns out that the maximum weight independent set problem, or even the simpler version, where every vertex has weight one, in which case we're simply trying to maximize the number of vertices in the independent set, this problem is NP complete. I know we haven't formally defined that, but you know we will, and you already know it means really hard and we're almost certain that it takes exponential time. But on trees, what about the special case where the graph is a tree? No loops. Not necessarily a binary tree, any old tree. Okay. Well, there are still trade-offs, right? And for instance, if you start at the root of the tree and try to go down and use a greedy algorithm, you can come up with examples where a greedy algorithm fails miserably. Okay. So greed here is a bad idea. It really might be good to, you know, there might be a nice tasty vertex here with a big weight, but it might be better to deny yourself that vertex because then maybe you'll be able to include more things with a greater total weight on the next level down. Okay, so greed fails. But, and now I'm giving you a big hint, but it is in the book. Let's first decide whether we're taking this vertex or not. Okay. 
So this part of the problem interacts with this part of the problem. There are complicated trade-offs. I cannot solve them independently. But once I decide whether or not to take this vertex, then it breaks apart. Okay. For instance, if I take this vertex, you know I can't have either of these. But now there's no edges anymore connecting these two things. So once I've made that choice, the two subtrees become independent subproblems. And that's pretty much the whole algorithm, right? At least for the purposes of our class. So um, that's another case where, where, uh, where dynamic programming works very well. Um, and, you know, you can even ask, well, let's see, what about, what about this problem on a square lattice, a big square grid? Well, now there's a very rich set of interconnections between the different parts of the problem. Okay. Whereas in a tree, by definition, between any two vertices, there's a unique path, which you can cut with one of those choices. Here it takes more choices to cut it. Okay. But you might still be able to gain something. So for instance, I claim that, so what's the brute force approach here? How long would the brute force search take on an n by n? Well, let, let's, let's actually say this is L by L. So the total number of vertices n is L squared. So how long would the totally brute force approach take? Just go through all possible sets and find the best one. It's like 2 to the L squared. It's like 2 to the L squared, 2 to the n. Yeah. I know it's really something less than 2 because since it's an independent set, once you choose to take something, you know you can't take its neighbors. But it's something raised to the L squared. Okay. Because the number of independent sets does grow exponentially. Maybe not quite as fast as 2 to the n once you take the rule about no two neighbors into account, but it still grows exponentially. Well, I claim that using dynamic programming, you can go from this to something which is basically this, which is a huge improvement. Okay. So here, dynamic programming doesn't get us all the way down to a polynomial time algorithm, but it helps a lot. Okay, So if L were 50, 2 to the 50 is a lot better than 2 to the 2,500. Okay. All right. Okay. So any more questions or comments about dynamic programming before we move on? to another big <coughs> family of uh, polynomial time algorithms. Well, it seems dynamic programming improves the I mean, <coughs> running time by kind of sacrificing the, I mean, these more spaces. And, and, and as you said, as long as the complexity of the number goes, we kind of, you know, focus on one aspect of, of that, that either space or running time. I'm kind of tricky if it got two both of them involved. So you're, say, you're saying the problem is that, so you're saying that dynamic programming saves time but uses more memory and you're worried about what happens if the memory use explodes. Yeah, yeah, I, I think it's quite possible if, yeah, kind of the, the cost in the space kind of, you know, overtake the, the running time. <laughs> yeah, no, I mean, that's a, that's a good concern to have in general, but I'm not sure that dynamic programming is actually very expensive in terms of memory. Okay. I, think it's, I think it's just a better way to organize the recursion. It's true that if, you know, yes, by memoizing, okay, I mean, it, it's absolutely true that <coughs> a totally naive algorithm, a totally naive recursive algorithm takes less space than one with memoization, right? Mm -hmm. So for instance, um, uh, well, yes and no. <laughs> so let's, let's look at our naive recursive algorithm 
for the Fibonacci numbers. Okay. <coughs> now, on the one hand, you're not remembering the fact that you already calculated things previously. Um, on the other hand, you do need to maintain a stack as you do this recursion. Yeah. And that stack might not contain as much memory as a list of previous responses, but it's reasonably deep. It's going to be order n. Maybe by remembering the table, it's more like order n squared because they grow exponentially, so the nth Fibonacci number has order n bits, and then we have n times n or something like that. Um, but for instance, in this case, I claim that uh, this algorithm only uses polynomial a polynomial amount of memory. Um, but you're right, it might sometimes make it a worse polynomial by, by, by remembering all the subproblems you've done before. And, and it is also true that when we talk later on in the semester about uh, highly memory efficient algorithms, we often are willing to give up a lot on the running time. And if you really have limited memory, yes, you have to recalculate things because you don't have enough memory to remember the calculations you did before. So you're absolutely right that in general there's a trade-off between running time and memory. All right. <coughs> um, yeah, in fact, in the second half of the semester, we'll see some algorithms that use astonishingly little memory but they do it by recalculating things many times. All right, so um, the, next, the next type of polynomial time algorithm I want to talk about is really, uh, <coughs> it really stems from a single problem, but the family of algorithms that people have come up with to answer this problem are, well, it's such a basic problem that the algorithms that solve it kind of deserve their own family of algorithms. And that's calculating shortest paths. And I know, again, that you've all seen in your algorithms courses algorithms for shortest path, um, like Dijkstra's algorithm and so on. I think Dijkstra's algorithm is rather boring, and I want to talk about a different algorithm, which uses much different ideas. Okay, maybe I'm being too negative, but let me show you a different, a different idea. So once again, I have a graph. And um, for now, I want, to, I want to ask an even more basic question than finding the shortest path, which is a problem that I'll call reachability. So the input is a graph and two vertices. And the question is, is there a path from S to T? And let's say we can even make it a directed graph if you want. Okay. Name an algorithm that solves this problem. We don't need anything as powerful as Dijkstra's algorithm. Dijkstra's algorithm actually finds the length of the shortest path or the, short <coughs> or the shortest path itself. Oh, like red first search? Sure, yeah. red first search. Yeah. So I mean, or depth first search. So you could do the following thing. Explore, how does it start? Um, mark S as explored. And um, put S in a data structure, which I will call Q. And then while Q is non-empty, remove a vertex U from Q, mark U, and put U's neighbors in Q. Keep doing that until Q is completely empty, and then, you know, 
if T is marked, return yes, there is a path. Otherwise, no. Okay? Is this algorithm clear? Now, the nice thing is, as you probably know, that the only difference between depth first and breadth first search is what kind of data structure Q is and what we actually mean by these words remove and put. If it is a stack and it does last in first outs, the most recently put thing in is the first to be removed, we do depth first search. If it's a queue so that um, you, it's like a line of people standing in line for a movie and you're removing them from this end and putting new things in at that end, then it's first in, first out, and it's breadth first search. And that's really the only difference between those two ideas. And either way, it will eventually mark everywhere that we can reach from S. In fact, come to think of it, I didn't need to mark S at the beginning. I could start by just putting, seeding the, this data structure with S. All right, well, this is, this is fine. Uh, this will work. But I want, to, I want to show you another way to think about this problem, which will turn out to have um, important applications later on. And that is that given G, I can define an adjacency matrix. AIJ, which is one if there is an edge from I to J and zero otherwise. Um, this is a symmetric matrix if and only if the graph is, you know, un undirected or if you like if every edge goes both ways. Otherwise, it's not, uh, not generally symmetric. And now I want to claim that um, when we do breadth first search, when we start with S and at each step we expand, if you like, it's like a sphere growing outward in the graph, right? So at every step, we go <coughs> one place farther. I claim the following, that um, uh, there is a path from S to T of L or fewer steps. But only if the elf power of A has a non-zero component at S comma T. I left that space in there because um, I want to give you the option of staying put on a given step. And the way I defined A, I don't generally have paths from a vertex to itself. So I'm going to add the identity matrix to A, right? How many of you have already seen this? Not so many. No. I, I was reading the book, but I, I didn't understand it. All right. So what, is it, what does it mean when we multiply a matrix? Right? So first of all, this is, this is this matrix times itself L times using the matrix product. Mm -hmm. So, you know, let's look at A squared. So, a squared sub i k is the sum over all j of a i j a j k. So what does this mean, right? I mean, what this means is that you're trying to get from i to k, and there's a bunch of different j's that you could go through. It's the sum over all of these different j's of one I mean, this is a product of two things, which this product is only one if they're both one, right? Yeah. So it's one if there is an edge from I to J and an edge from J to K. Yeah. Okay. So in fact, we can say more. It's not just that this is non-zero if there's a path of length two from I to K. It's the number of paths yeah. of length two from I to K. All right? Now, uh, the, the, I don't understand the, the, the identity matrix. What is the... Well, so if I want, so this is the number of paths whose length is exactly two. Okay. 
But if, I mean, what if I want two or less? Then I want to give you the option of taking, uh, of having one of your step being staying put. For that matter, what if I and K are the same, right? I certainly want to say that I can reach K. You're already there. So what I'm going to do is on a given step, you can either move along one of the edges of the graph or you can stay where you are. Okay. So now your first step could be doing this and your second step could be doing that. Um, you know, yet another way to put this is that, and there's a lot of redundancy here, right? I mean, this also allows you to do the same thing by on the first step doing this and on the second step doing that. So in some ways, it might be that a better way to write this is the matrix of places that you can reach is, well, you can stay where you are. Everybody can be reached from themselves. Or you can take one step in the graph, or you can take two steps, or you can take three steps, and so on. And I'm not going to use the following fact, but it is a beautiful fact you should understand, that this is a geometric series. And that formally, although there's, you know, depending on the nature of A, it might not converge. <coughs> formally, you know, what's the sum of a geometric series? It's 1 over 1 minus the thing. But what does 1 over here mean? And what does 1 minus mean? Well, it means this, the matrix inverse of that, if it exists. I'm not going to use that, but you should see the connection. <coughs> and indeed, this would converge if, for instance, instead of ones on the edges, I had some sufficiently small number on the edges, then it would converge because the, you know, as I powered it up, then I would get powers of that number and it would converge. Um, all right, but we don't actually need to use this beautiful, wonderful fact, which you should all know. Um, all right, so the point is that uh, in, you know, in a graph of n vertices, what's the highest power of this matrix I could ever need? N minus one. N minus one. Let's be generous and call it N. So here's another algorithmic idea for solving reachability, which is calculate this to the end. Okay, calculate the nth power of that matrix. All right, everybody with me still? Now, this isn't necessarily a different algorithmic idea. It depends on how we do this. So one way to do this is to start with the identity matrix and multiply it by the identity plus A n times. <coughs> okay. Now keep in mind here that I'm giving you G as part of the input. I actually have to give you a map of G. So that means that G only has a polynomial number of vertices, right? Remember, polynomial always means, since you've read chapter two, you know that it always means as a function of the size of the input. And if I'm actually showing you the entire graph, well, with n bits, there's no way I could tell you more than about more than n vertices and how they're connected to each other. So this isn't quite like the problem we had last time when we talked about raising an n-bit number to the power of another n-bit number, because there the exponent was exponentially large. There multiplying it the exponent number of times would take exponential time. So we needed to use that repeated squaring idea, which in a sense was divide and conquer, right? Keep squaring it. And that way you double the exponent every time. Well, that repeated squaring idea will turn out to be useful here too, though even though it's true that one way we could do this is just multiply this and out, just multiply this out n times. It's an n by n matrix. You're doing n matrix multiplications. Each matrix multiplication takes, let's call it n cubed steps. It's a polynomial. Okay, so n to the fourth, n to the something. It's polynomial. That would work. In terms of exploring the graph, what does that strategy correspond to? Where in each in each round of the algorithm, I multiply again by 1 plus a. 
I'm going one search. step below in that depth first search. I'm just exploring my, my neighborhood again. But in a sense, we're exploring, we're moving out everywhere in parallel, yeah. which is thread first, first search. Right, so in other words, if, if the places I've gotten to, <coughs> if this is the set of places I've reached, then multiplying one plus a and looking at where I have a non-zero value is basically saying, well, you can reach all these places plus the places you can get to with one more step. And that's like breadth first search. It's like sort of one entire round of breadth first search. Okay. But it seems that it might be more efficient to square this log n times instead of multiply it n times. And this idea in this setting will merely give us a better polynomial time algorithm. But later on, it's going to make a bigger difference later on in the semester. So, um, <coughs> so here's, our, here's our new algorithm. So do the following log base 2n times. So let's start with this matrix B. It'll be sort of our running, our running uh, tally of where we can reach. Its initial value will be 1 plus A. So log base 2n times set B equal to B times B. Okay. I know sometimes people make the error the other way. Yeah. All right. I like the error going this way. All right, so square B, multiply it by itself as a matrix. All right. So now what you're doing is you're doubling the length of your path at every step. Right? Because, let's put it this way. Let's say that at the nth stage, I mean, let's, rather than using the same letter B at every stage, let's call this B sub M, okay? So B sub M is B sub M minus 1 squared. And I claim that B sub M sub S comma T is non-zero if and only if there is a path from S to T of length less than or equal to what? 2 to the M. Okay. And, you know, because after all, what are we doing? We're saying, you know, B to the M sub IK is again B to the M minus 1 sub IJ. It's the product of all the ways to go from I to J and then from J to K, but then summed over all J. And if this is a path of length L over 2 or less, and this is a path of length L over 2, then this whole thing is a path of length L. All right? So, you know, what's the running time of this algorithm? Well, if each, if each matrix multiplication of n by n matrices takes, say, n cubed time, well, it's not such a, such a huge savings. Before, we had n to the fourth because we did n matrix multiplications. Now we have n cubed times log n because we're doing log n matrix multiplications. All right, well, it's still a good savings. And more importantly, it's a good idea. Um, and it's an especially good idea because in the second half of the semester, we will think about reachability on exponentially large graphs. We will say, your laptop has, let's say it has m bits of memory. So there are two to the m different states that all those bits of memory can be in. That is an exponentially large graph. 
and it would be absurd to try to write it down. But if you tell me what program you're running, and you tell me, here's my current state, am I, here's my current list of m bits. Now, is it possible for me, after one step of computation, the next step of computation, to be in this set of m bits? Well, I can answer that question by looking at what program you're running, looking at what instruction you're about to execute, and simulating it, and seeing if it does indeed go from this setting of all, your, all the bits of your laptop to this setting. So in other words, this will be a graph whose size is exponentially long, each, whose size is exponentially large. Each vertex will correspond to one of the two to the m settings of the m bits of your computer. But it's not just any graph of exponential size. If I want to ask the question, is there an edge from here to here, I can answer that question efficiently because that corresponds to simulating one step of your program. And then predicting what your program will do will be a reachability problem in this exponentially large graph. And once, once the size of this graph is this exponentially big capital M thing, then this repeated squaring idea will become essential. Because now I cannot afford to multiply, you know, to multiply this thing out capital N times where N is exponentially large. But if I can square it log capital N times, and that's manageable as a function of the size of your memory. So we'll talk about that later. But anyway, this repeated squaring thing will become very important once we're thinking about reachability on exponentially size uh, on exponentially large graphs. Um, now, in some sense, we could stop here, but I, I think it's nice to generalize this algorithm in a couple of different ways. So at the moment, this matrix um, doesn't just hold a bit of information about whether, uh, whether there's a path from I to K or not. It holds some pretty big integer, actually, which is some sort of count of all the paths that you could take from I to K. All right? Plus some redundancy about, you know, counting staying put and then taking a step differently from taking a step and then staying put. But so it's some big integer which counts lots of different ways to get from one place to another. Let's suppose that all we want is a <coughs> matrix um, which of zeros and ones, which says, can you get from here to there? Okay? So now, um, oops, that's a sum over J. Well, we can get this using exactly the same idea. We have to change, we just have to change what we mean by multiplying two matrices together a little bit. Okay? So before, we, chain, we set our matrix B um, equal to B squared, where what that meant is, well, I know I'm repeating myself, but I'm going to repeat myself. Bij times Bjk. And again, this is the sum over all J of the product of all the ways to get from I to J, of which for each for each j there might be many, times all the ways to get from that j to k. And then it's that product of this, this number times this number summed over all j. Well, what if I just want a Boolean value that tells me whether I can get from i to k? How should I change this expression? You can stop whenever you get the first one. I could stop, but but what what does that mean? Because I I mean, <coughs> you mean stop the whole program? Uh, I mean, in terms of the formula, we just not use the summation. But just yes. What would I replace the summation with? Um, or, yeah. I replace yeah. it with the or. So if you don't mind, this is a big or, right? Just as this is a big plus. So it's the or of all these things. 
And what do I replace the product with? And. and. Okay. So the structure of the algorithm is exactly the same. I still, quote unquote, square the matrix log n times. But now I've changed my definition of matrix product. Instead of the sum of the product, it's the order of the ands. Okay? And after all, sum is kind of like or, and product is kind of like and, in terms of whether things are zero or, zero or non-zero. Right? All right, so that's nice. So you know, this way, instead of these big integers building up, it's just a bit. And I do this log n times, and then I just check to see whether b sub s comma t is 1 or 0. All right, that's nice. Well, but let's take this one step further. Now suppose that what I want the matrix B to contain is the length of the shortest path. OK, the length of the shortest path. So now what I want is, let's, let's change our, our problem a little bit. So now G is a weighted graph where each edge has a weight. And um, so here's the input and two vertices. And the question is, what is the total, the length? Uh, I mean, maybe we should call it a length graph where each edge has a length, but people call these weights. So it's a little bit awkward because you say, well, the length is the total weight of the edges, and it's a really bad mixed metaphor. But anyway, the length, <coughs> as in the total weight of the shortest, that is, lightest, path from S to T. And what should I call this if there is no path from S to T? Infinity. Yeah, so if there's no path. All right. So now I want to change my definition of matrix multiplication once more. So now, what should I change the sum over j or the or over j to? I should change it to the minimum over all j. And then what should I have inside? Well, no. Yeah, plus. The sum. Yeah. <coughs> so this says the, the shortest path from i to k, and it's b sub i k, is the minimum over all the intermediate points j that you could go through of the shortest path from i to j plus the shortest path from j to k. Okay. So again, the shape of the algorithm hasn't changed at all. We still quote unquote square log n times, but now this is what we mean by squaring. And now I claim that after squaring m times, b sub, b sub i k for all i k is the length of the shortest path from i to k, but among those consisting of 2 to the m steps or fewer. Okay. So at the beginning, I set, initially, I set bij equal to the weight of this edge, if it is, a, if it is an edge. 
and infinity if it isn't. Okay? So at this point, what B holds is the length of the shortest path. Uh, oh, I also say that I'll also say that it's zero if i equals j. It costs you nothing to get from where you are to where you are. So this is the length of the shortest path of length one or less, right? Either you can get there in one step, either you're already there, or you can get there in one step with this weight, or you can't get there in one step. But now as I start squaring the matrix, it starts realizing, hey, I can get there in two steps. Then on the next stage it says, you know, this four-step path actually has a smaller total weight than that two-step path I had before. And it keeps improving by taking the, min the minimum over and over again. Right. So there's a homework problem, which is that, um, so again, if we set this up, we'll get, <coughs> we'll get n cubed log n because Again, it takes me this many steps to do to square my matrix, except now it's this in this sense. And I do that log n times. It turns out you can get rid of this by rearranging things a little bit. Um, and that's called the floyd warshall algorithm. Um, notice also that what this what this algorithm actually does is it calculates this answer simultaneously for all S and T. And I'm pretty sure you've heard of this before. This is actually called the all pairs shortest path problem. And because in computer science we like to invent acronyms, we call it APSP. Because things just look more impressive when they're in all capital letters. Um, all right. So uh, anyway, so this is, I, I think this is a very nice approach. and. So, for instance, if you, how many of you have already taken 530? So about half. So in 530, you'll study Markov chains, right? And t steps of a Markov chain corresponds to the t -th power of the matrix, the transition matrix. It's exactly the same idea, except that now the matrix entries are not probabilities. They're the weights of edges, but it's exactly the same idea, right? All right, any questions about all this? So th this was section, what, 3.4 or something? <coughs> so, you know, hopefully as you read this, you can compare it to your carefully taken class notes and email me if there's anything unclear. Um, all righty. So, we're most of the way through chapter three now. There's one other family of algorithms that really, that really needs to be discussed. <coughs> so <coughs> should we talk about anything else as we move on? So one, one thing I want to point out is that these families of algorithms overlap because this is also a dynamic programming algorithm, right? What is this saying? It, it's saying recursively, if we've already solved the subproblem of finding all the shortest paths of two to the m minus one steps or less. <coughs> we can use this recursion to find all the shortest paths of length two to the m or less. Okay, so it is also dynamic programming. And, um, you know, it, it's saying recursively, if you want to get from i to k in l steps, the way to do that, in L or fewer steps, the way to do that recursively is to find a midpoint J and figure out how to get from I to J in L over two or less steps and from J to K in L over two or less steps. Okay. And if you've already figured out all the best ways to do that, then you have all the best paths of length L or less. All right. So it's, it's again, it's, you can think of it, this as a recursive algorithm but this is a sort of, this is a bottom-up version of it, right? Where I start with the paths of length one, use them to build the paths of length two, use those to build the paths of length four, and so on. 
I could take this same equation and think of it as a top-down recursive algorithm, right? Which would take exponential time if you recalculated things many times. But if you remember that you've calculated earlier versions of this matrix and don't recalculate, then you'll have a polynomial time algorithm. Is that clear? Yes. So you said that uh, there is uh, an algorithm um, uh, n to q times log n can uh, reduce to the n power q, right? And uh, yes. does it mean that uh, all of the dynamic programming, uh, we can use some, uh, the same trick so that we can reduce the running time from the, some running, uh, the more, uh, the, I, I mean that we can reduce our running time for all of the dy dynamic programming? <coughs> well, so roughly speaking, the running time of a dynamic programming algorithm will be the number of different sub-problems that you're having to solve. In, in the notes <coughs> section, by the way, I forgot you, so these little feathers in the margin, those refer to the notes at the end of the chapter, okay? So there's lots of historical notes and references, except I didn't give you the bibliography. <laughs> if you really want the bibliography, I'll be happy to provide it. Um, so, uh, you know, so for instance, a famous example of, of um, of dynamic programming is is uh, sequence alignment or or finding the minimum edit distance, which is another common example. And here, what's happening uh, is you are trying to match up two strings. Uh, <coughs> let's move these over. So you're trying to match up two strings. They could be two bits of DNA, and you're trying to find the minimum number of insertions, deletions, and mutations. I guess actually if mutations are allowed, I can line that K up with that M. Okay, so this says that you can change a pastry cook to an astronomer by removing the P, the Y, and the C, adding <coughs> the N, and changing the K to an M. Okay, and that's probably the cheapest way to do it, besides sending them to graduate school. Huh. Okay. Um, so, pastry cooks have to go to advanced school also, so I don't want to imply that one of these skills is more advanced than the other. Um, so, finding the best way, again, the number of possible ways to match these two strings up is exponential. So, again, if you just were totally naive, you might think this would take exponential time, but instead there's this dynamic programming algorithm, which a lot like the <laughs> typesetting algorithm where the, you need to find where the best location of the next line break is and then after that the rest of the problem can be solved independently. Here you need to decide, you need to look at those first two symbols and you need to decide should I say that I'm inserting P or should I say that I'm inserting A or should I say that I'm mutating the P to an A. Once you make one of those choices then you can solve the rest of the problem independently. So now, if both of these strings are length n, the number of different sub-problems <coughs> that you'll ever run into is order what? Well, no, because, I mean, yeah, in some sense, there's there's a there's an exponential number of choices that you could make, but dynamic programming works because you know now I'm solving the subproblem of matching everything starting with that a with everything starting with there, and then if I choose to match those up, I'm now facing the subproblem of matching everything starting with s to everything starting with that s. So I'm always matching some tail of the first sequence with some tail of the second sequence. So how many subproblems are there? N squared. So in this case, you know, so in typesetting there was order N subproblems. In this case it's order N squared. So if you look in the notes, there are some general rules about what the typical running time of a dynamic programming algorithm is. And there are often clever ways to improve it still further. Right? I mean it may be that you can eliminate many of these subproblems from consideration. And that would cut things down further. Any other questions before we move on? 
All right, so um, this brings us, you know, <coughs> skipping lots of delicious historical material and so on. Um, this brings us to section 3.6, which is about the max flow problem. By the way, one of the homework problems, so I just told you that this algorithm for finding shortest paths is a dynamic programming algorithm. There's actually often, analog often an analogy you can make in the other direction too. So one of the homework problems um, says, rephrase the typesetting problem as a shortest path problem. Okay. <coughs> so in other words, if I give you a paragraph, and remember some cost function for the cost of putting a certain string of words on one line, invent a graph such that the best way to typeset the paragraph corresponds to the shortest path from through the graph. What should the vertices be? What should the edges be? What should their weights be? Okay. So um, the string alignment or genome alignment or edit distance problem I just described is can also can also be described as a shortest path problem. I know that many of you have already seen this, but let me just show it to you again. Um, so I'm not sure I can really. Uh, all right. So here's pastry cook. Here's astronomer. So the idea is that a vertex is going to mark what we have done so far and what we have left to do. So I'm going to make a grid like this, and I'm not I probably took an example somewhat larger than I want. So this vertex is I haven't done anything yet. Now, I have three choices. I can put in P with no partner on the other side, I, assuming that I'm inserting P. I'll call that moving along this edge. All right. <coughs> Another choice would be to assume that that P actually matches up with the A in astronomer, in which case I'm mutating it from a P to an A. Okay. Well, both of those things cost me one if I'm saying that each insertion or deletion costs me one and each mutation costs me one. So I'll put ones on those edges. And th so that's a diagonal edge where I sort of move forward on both strings at once. Now, however, if I did the right thing and just put that P in, then now I can match this A with that A. And when I do that, that costs me nothing. Okay. So what I have here is a graph. If both strings are length n, I have a graph with n squared vertices, or n times m vertices, if one string is length n and the other is length m. And I have a bunch of edges. And the diagonal edges cost 0 if the two letters are the same. And otherwise, they cost 1. And all the horizontal and vertical edges cost 1. And now, the optimal alignment is simply the shortest path from here to there. So I, I'm, I'm pretty sure some of you have seen this already in 561, right? Yeah. But it's a nice, it's a very nice picture, right? So it's nice to be able to recast these problems in these very different forms. Because we have different, you know, I mean, growing up on the savanna, right? You know, your brain develops all these little modules. We have a little bit of uh, geometric intuition. We have a little bit of mathematical ability. We have a little bit of kind of algebraic intuition. Well, it's good to be able to translate problems into different forms so that different modules in our brains can help us out. All right. Um, good. So let me describe the max flow problem, and then we will talk about algorithms for it on Thursday, because it turns out that the algorithm for max flow and its relationship to another problem called min cut is perhaps the deepest idea we have so far about polynomial time algorithms. Um, 
and it's, it's related to this notion of duality. So um, here's, the max, here's the max flow problem. Um, I have some graph, a directed graph, with two distinguished vertices, S and T, which are my source and my destination. And on each, <coughs> on each edge of the graph, there is a capacity, which is the amount of flow that I can carry along that edge. Okay. So, for instance, I have this charming paragraph where I say, well, the vertices are cities. Here's our university. We're trying to get as many students as possible to this conference. And this is the number of, you know, money's no object. Our, our research group is very well funded. But this is the number of available seats on all of these flights. Okay. So, um, you know, one thing I could do is uh, I could send three students to the conference. And that would, I could do that with a flow that looks like this. I could send <coughs> two students on this flight using it completely. I could send one student on this flight. I could send one student on this flight. In this city, these two students meet for coffee and get together on this flight. This student is somewhat lonely and flies on this flight. And the total flow I managed to get from my source to, de to my destination is three. Okay? So obviously you can define this formally. There are rules similar to the rules for, elect for electrical flow and electrical network. At every vertex except the source and the destination, the total flow in has to equal the total flow out. And along each edge, the flow has to be less than or equal to the capacity. All right? But of course, as you can see, this flow is not optimal. Yeah. It's much better to forget this edge completely yeah. and to send two along this path and two along this path, and that gives me a total flow of four. So the max flow problem is, <coughs> given this directed graph and the list of capacities on the edges, find the, as it's usually called, the value of the maximum flow and find the, find the maximum flow. So find for me how to send as many students as possible to the conference. All right. Now, um, this problem uh, is solvable in polynomial time, but the <coughs> algorithm is a little bit subtle, right? And the reason it's subtle is that, um, so the following type of thing is pretty reasonable. So look at all the, all the seats that you've already chosen to buy. And this leaves you with a sort of residual graph, a graph of the remaining capacity. All right? So for instance, in my flow before, the flow of value 3, uh, and these things are always a little bit hard to draw. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take one out of two of those seats, one out of one of those seats, two out of two of these, Two out of two of these, one out of two of those. Okay? So that was my first flow for the total value of three. Okay? So. <coughs> so one along here, two along there, one along here, one along here, and two along there. Okay? Now, if I were to subtract all of these flows from the capacities, what capacity would be left? Well, I have nothing here, nothing here, nothing here, one here, and one here. <coughs> now, if there were a path of edges with non-zero leftover capacity, residual capacity, then I could certainly send a student along that path. Okay. So, for instance, if I if if there was still a seat on this flight, I could send a student that way. All right. So you can always add flow along any path, which is still a, a valid path in this residual graph. The problem is sometimes you'll get stuck if you do that. So remember our discussion of greedy algorithms about how you might get stuck in a local optimum where 
There's no simple thing you can do to improve matters. Well, actually, if my idea of an improvement is find a path of non-zero residual capacity and add a student along that path, I am now stuck. There are no paths from here to here that have non-zero leftover capacity. The problem was it was a mistake to send a student along this middle edge. Okay? So in a sense, I'm stuck here at this flow of value three, <coughs> and I'm not going to get to the optimal flow, or I just send two across the top and two across the bottom, unless I undo my mistake. Okay, and pull back this student, thus renewing this flow. And actually, so getting rid of this student and putting this flow back here and back here, and now saying, oh, I should do this and this instead. So one of the lessons here is that um, whether or not you're stuck depends on what moves you're allowed to make. Okay. If, my, if, my only, if the only moves I'm allowed to make is to add another, more flow on top of my existing flow along some path, then I got stuck. But if I allow a slightly fancier set of moves that allow me to reverse some of my previous flow, then I can get unstuck. So it's like one simple set of moves makes the landscape look like this. It's bumpy. You get stuck in local optima. If you adopt a larger, a larger set of if you adopt a larger set of moves that let you make bigger changes, then it reorganizes the landscape and makes it look like this. <coughs> and now a greedy algorithm that just keeps improving the flow will always find the optimum, except since we're trying to maximize the flow, I guess I should be drawing these as hills instead of valleys. Okay, so here we climb up and get stuck, but if we allow ourselves these fancier moves, we climb straight up to the top. So we'll describe those fancier moves next time. Um, then the other very interesting thing about this problem is that it has a partner problem, a dual problem. <coughs> so by the way, how many of you are already familiar with the algorithm for this? It's usually called the Ford-Fulkerson algorithm. Nobody, okay. So I think this is one area of polynomial time algorithms which we usually don't have time to cover in 561, so this will be new material. So here's the partner problem. The partner problem is called min cut. So now there is a, an evil competitor of ours who wants to publish first and suppress all the news of the progress that we've been making. So this competitor is also very well funded. And what they're going to do is they're going to buy a few seats on one airplane, a few seats on another airplane, just enough so that none of us can go to the conference. Okay. Now, they're well-funded, but they certainly want to minimize their costs so that they'll have money left over for champagne and caviar. <laughs> and um, so their goal is to find the smallest total cost of edges that they can cut by filling them up so that there's no seats left. And um, in this case, there's a couple different ways they could do that. They could, they could cut this edge. So let's go back to our capacities. So here's two, two, one, two, two. There's a couple things they could do. They could cut this edge buying those two <coughs> seats, cut this edge buying that seat, and cut this edge. And that would cost them five seats, and it would prevent us from going to the conference. Of course, a cheaper thing they could do, as you can e easily see, is they could cut this edge and this edge, so just there's no way to leave the starting city. Or on the other end, they could cut this edge and this edge. And each of those cuts would cost them only four instead of five. Well, the interesting thing is that the cost of the minimum cut equals the value of the maximum flow. I invite you, with or without the help of the book, to try to prove this over the weekend. It's fairly obvious in one direction, I think. 
But the other direction, I think, is not so obvious. So, I mean, it's <coughs> obvious in the sense that, um, let's see. Dum -de -dum. Let's see, which one is obvious? I guess if it were that obvious, I would. So you say that this is obvious. Why is that obvious? The others. The other way is obvious? Yeah, because. You know, you joke about the mathematicians, and 45 minutes later they say, oh, yes, it's obvious. You're right. <laughs> so, um, okay, why is, why is this one obvious? It's kind of bottom there. Right, yeah. It's, so, so, for instance, um, let's take any cut, okay, even if it's not the minimum one. Let's take, l let's take the cut where um, we really need some electronic media here. So let's take the cut where our adversary cuts this edge, this edge, and this edge. Okay. So I claim the fact that this cut exists proves that the maximum flow is less than or equal to 5. Because this is, as you said, a bottleneck. It's like an interface between where we are and where we're trying to go. The total cost of this cut equals the total capacity of all the edges crossing this interface. Okay, But we have to cross that interface. So since the total capacity of all the edges that cross from the S side to the T side is 5, there's no way we can push more than a flow of 5 through. Okay. So I claim that <coughs> that cut proves that the maximum flow is at most 5. Then again, I claim that this cut proves that the maximum flow is at most 4, which is also true. Okay. So I claim that any cut places an upper bound on the maximum flow, and the minimum cut places the best upper bound on the maximum flow. Got that? The tightest possible upper bound. But proving the other direction is not so simple. And, a and actually, in some ways, the simplest way to prove it is to analyze the algorithm that finds the max flow. Okay. So that's what we'll talk about on Tuesday. And this phenomenon turns out to be much, much more general than max flow min cut. This phenomenon of duality turns out to apply to a whole host of optimization problems. Basically, uh, any what's <coughs> called linear programming problem, any optimization problem where you have a bunch of constraints which are inequalities, like on each edge the flow has to be less than or equal to, to the capacity, and there's some linear function, in this case the total flow, that you're trying to optimize. So it turns out that any problem in that entire family has a dual problem in which you're trying to minimize instead of maximize. And the optimum of one always equals the optimum of the other. Pretty cool. All right. So read this chapter. That's what you say. Yes? One problem easier to solve than another. Well, once you know they're equivalent, so the question is, is one of these problems easier than the other? Once you know they're equivalent, they're equally hard. But before you knew that, I think Min Cut looks harder sometimes. Yeah, I'm doing that. You give it to me, I like it. Yeah. You just said, I don't get to know your name. Okay. Oh yeah. 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 That's a little late. <laughs> 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 I was upset. I'm just waiting.
<laughs> no, it's up in your face. No, the like you're disturbing. Okay, so let's go. 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 Let's go.